you like that warm up, Chris? Wow, that was beautiful. That was, that was <laughs> nice mood, nice mood setting. I liked it. I liked it. Does it fit it was, with the economy vibe? Well, let's hope so. Let's hope the economy's got this nice, smooth, copacetic feeling going to it. That's yeah, right. <laughs> that'd be good. That'd be good. Awesome. Did you did you create that riff yourself? Uh, Dude, you know? that 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 was a straight blonde creation <laughs> right there. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. Yeah, yeah, you better be careful now because I figured out how to create those things, so I'm dangerous now. Nice, nice. Not that they'll like be it. any good, but whatever, you know, it's fun. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's right. Well, welcome well, back. Not, this is. Are you going to start us off, Chris? You want? Me yeah, to- I was just going to start us off. Say, I'm Chris Sykes with Sonoma Wealth Advisors, and we've got Darren Blonsky here. We're doing Tuesday night on the economy. This is our weekly dive into the the uh, the economy, kind of underlying what's going on in the markets, and uh, and, and try to take take you through some charts that we're looking at. So. This week we'll kick it off with some pretty deep finance humor. Uh, <laughs> we've got Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and uh, and Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, burying price discovery. So, for those for those that aren't hip to the 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 language, Darren, what's price discovery? Well, so when we look at the chart, so guys like me who are more technical in nature just all they care about is price discovery and what's actually happening on the charts. And the guys who are more fundamental, like Chris, um, they like the more the fundamentals that guide the market. And with Janet Yellen and Jaron Powell doing the printing that they're doing, uh, that's making it very difficult to interpret the data and what the market is doing exactly because the fundamentals are not on in line with what you would expect. And so they're giving all kinds of different signals in different directions and it makes it very difficult for people who are macro economists economists in general to say hey because of this indicator this is going to happen or this isn't going to happen so that's why mm-hmm. people who are more technical in nature and who love the charts uh, find solace in moments like this when the fundamentals are absolutely seemingly flawed yeah it's good to have both toolkits right and and that's exactly right with the price discovery you know typically markets being free markets set the prices on on everything but most specifically the price of money and i would say that that is where uh traders and and macroeconomists alike are are kind of banging their heads against the wall because with so much stimulus with so much interference by the fed in the markets um you you have a tough time knowing what is the correct price for things because uh, markets are being set by by policy, especially fixed income markets, which are typically, um, you know, kind of a beacon, right, in the storm for for people to be able to know what's going on in the underlying uh, pricing of money. That's been completely distorted now. So it wouldn't be. I, on- <laughs> I leave you alone with the slide deck for five minutes, and this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, this one in on me. <laughs> we, we, it wouldn't be on the economy without talking about Dogecoin or Doggy Coin, however you want to pronounce it. But so there's this this cryptocurrency out there that was originally created as kind of a spoof, right, to make fun of cryptocurrencies in general, and it's had this astronomical rise. And you had uh, the founder of Tesla, Elon Musk, who kind of started popularizing it and talking about it. And it's this really kind of funny crypto that has none of the fundamentals that you would want for a cryptocurrency or a crypto asset to actually perform and do well. But yet it's gone and it's gone up to like 40 cents right now with some projecting it's going to get to a dollar, which is just mm-hmm. crazy. It's got something like a $40 billion market cap right now. And a mm-hmm. lot of 20 somethings and whatnot are trading this thing is like a big joke but it's also i think a I, I think it's symbolic of a broader economic story a broader economic understanding and it's one it's this this uh, the younger generations really disenfranchised and not happy with the way the economic footprint is laying out for their future and this is their way of kind of snubbing the market in some ways um and there's also kind of this irreverence about it 
And so yesterday or over the weekend when all the cryptocurrencies were just crashing in the last two days, uh, the uh, markets have not been doing well, but Doggy Coin and Dogecoin have been doing quite well uh, the last few days and holding up pretty well. But it also is symbolic of more speculation in the market, right? And so when we see this excessive speculation, that can usually be a sign that the Fed's looking at that saying, wow, maybe we're getting too much liquidity in the markets. Maybe there is too much cash. So it could be a flashing warning sign as well. And I think that's the bigger story behind it, other than the kind of irreverent um, snuff that the mm -hmm. uh, younger generations are sticking their um, their hand out at the um, older generations who are sticking them with a lot of debt. So kind of interesting, but I think very symbolic for the financial uh, circumstances that we're currently in. Yeah, and it's been kind of a characteristic of this market. Sorry, Darren, didn't mean to interrupt no. you there, but a characteristic of this market is that uh, we've seen this speculation hop from one place to another. It was GameStop, it was silver, right? And now it's Do Dogecoin and all these areas of the market where uh, these things keep popping up. And, you know, I, I think your point is really well taken that the Fed is probably seeing the speculation, but if, if history is a guide, they typically don't act until there's some sort of crisis, right? Especially if it's a well-publicized crisis. So a major hedge fund blows up, a pension fund, which would be even worse, uh, you know, something that leads to basically a systematic, uh, you know, uh, threat and in uh, board was on um uh um jeremy um grantham um, no not grantham uh wisdom tree uh schwartz his his podcast on bloomberg and he he basically said that that the fed pays attention to price changes but what they really pay attention to is disorder if it if it leads to something that's going to be disorderly in the market that's when they try to act. And so I think to your point, if, if this ends up causing some sort of wider systematic disorder, that's when you would worry about, you know, regulations or some, some sort of change coming out of the Fed. But until then, I kind of don't think it's, it's much of a chance that the, the Fed or the Treasury does much about it. Well, it's interesting because over the weekend, we had a couple headlines that I think are important. One, the Biden administration's putting together a regulator to deal with cryptos, right? Which is important. You have institutions like Bank of America walking back their comments today when they said, hey, we're not going to be involved with crypto saying, hey, we're mm -hmm. going to be involved with crypto potentially. And we'll show you some slides later um, in the deck where Goldman Sachs is using crypto as an asset class and they're they're putting it in all their slide decks as, you know, what were the top performing asset classes this year? And they're including Bitcoin in there now. So you have this general adoption and inclusion into the broader, I think, financial markets of Bitcoin. And you have the regulators starting to say, look, we're going to figure out a way to regulate this. You had Turkey that banned cryptocurrencies. You've had India that's working on banning cryptocurrencies. But then you have the U.S. taking a different look. But you also have China potentially. Um, they they really changed what they were doing. They're calling Bitcoin an asset class now uh, as of this week. So you're seeing these kind of shifts. What we saw this weekend happen is there was this quick sell off because some miners in China shut down from a power outage. And basically, it created a whole sell off of everyone who was shorting and overly um, leveraged in the Bitcoin trade. And that created this kind of cascade of sales in the market. Well, that can create systematic issues. And your point earlier, Chris, we we're talking about this, that could have blown up a hedge fund, right? And maybe a hedge fund was too leveraged. Uh, and so anytime we tend to see these excess, these really kind of uh, outside of the box areas, that they're, either the government's going to shut it down or figure out a way to regulate it because that's their job. They're trying to keep price stability. And, and Dogecoin certainly represents one of these just wild speculative um, and it started off and they call it the meme crypto, right? Because it was just basically a meme. It was a joke. And that's the whole point of this image you can see um, right here, which is this dude and he's walking out a door <laughs> and he's in the middle of the ocean, but the ocean is vertical. Uh, and, and that's kind of what we're seeing with this. And so we expect more, but I would certainly think at some point um, the Fed's going to step in. So now let's get to some nice, boring charts. Speaking of the Fed stepping in, and, <laughs> and this is what we were talking about with price discussion. So on the left, you see the chart where it shows um, asset securities that the Fed uh, holds outright. So you can think of mortgage-backed securities, uh, treasuries, et cetera, here. And you can see that just went 
parabolic last year um, and has continued so far this year. And then on the right, you can see the total assets of the Fed. Um, the balance sheet has just exploded this, la this last year. And what's interesting is, um, you know, take, take last year's explosion off the table and just look at like what's happened so far in 2020. And just that move alone would be major. But the fact that we're coming off last year's move, it doesn't feel as massive, right? And so when you're talking about price discovery, uh, this is what we're talking about, where you have a player in the market that is not price sensitive. They're not return sensitive. They're not, you know, uh, requiring a, a rate of return like an average investor would. And so that is distorting the price in the market um, and, and making it tough to see price discovery. And I think, you know, frankly, it's a big reason why it's it's tough to read a lot of the normal indicators that you would read in the economy to see, uh, you know, what you can expect moving forward. Well, on top of that, we're starting to see a lot of year, year, year over year numbers. So what that means, it's comparing this time last year to this time this year. And those year over year numbers are just crazy high. I mean, just stuff that's mm -hmm. off the charts. It's really difficult to even look at them within trends because they are so high. And we're going to continue seeing that, I suspect, um, until at least next year. Uh, we'll see how things go the rest of this year. But those year over year numbers, because they're so out of whack, make it really difficult for someone trying to look at the economy and say, hey, based upon such and such sales, we're going to show you some sales like car sales tonight that are just insane. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's hard to make a determination is just saying, hey, the market's going to do this because of that, uh, because of those year over year numbers are so um, just exaggerated. Um, so true. So true. Yeah. And and to that point, you know, I think it's to be clear, I don't think the Fed really had a choice. The government didn't have a choice. I mean, had they not stepped in, it's almost a certainty that we would have been in this, the next Great Depression, right? I mean, when no they doubt. people no like not paying their mortgages, businesses were forced to close, like they didn't they didn't really have a choice, right? Um, so I am in no way criticizing what happened, you know, uh, to be clear about it. but, um, but we see what we're looking at in terms of our deficits. And, you know, to be fair, we've run deficits basically since the 70s, except for a short period of time uh, in the 2000s there where we had a surplus. But I think it's safe to say this deficit is uh, orders of magnitude different. So investors are working in a different paradigm now. And there's not really a precedent for this in terms of looking back to history. We can say, well, the last time we did this, Here's what happened. Um, so far, it's uh, been very good for markets. Uh, it looks like it's been pretty good for the economy so far in terms of uh, the numbers bouncing back really quickly. Um, but what are the long-term implications of this, um, it, good and bad? Because there's got to be there's got to be both, right? And um, and and also, if there aren't really any long-term bad implications, which I'm suspect of, but if, if there aren't any where people tie it back, then why, I think people are going to say, let's just do this every time we have a recession. Let's just massively borrow and flood the economy with dollars and just, you know, hit, hit the patient with so much stimulus that, you know, even though he's had three heart attacks in a row, he's going to walk up, you know, stand up and start walking, maybe run a marathon. You know, well, that's, so that's much the question. Is, is, it, is it ever just too much? Right. And yeah, certainly what we're seeing now is maybe not. I don't know. And, and we're in a grand experiment. All of us are and every economy is and, and every government because every government had to do similar to what the U.S. has done, except maybe China. Uh, but you can argue that on both sides of the fence pretty heavily. So we don't know. And it's a grand experiment um, where we've seen these trade deficits are at all time lows, it looks like. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and by low, that's bad. Our our trade deficit is is at all time highs, basically. So, uh, so goods and services, basically the the deficit of what we're buying from outside the U.S. versus what we're selling to other countries, um, our our trade deficit is uh, is back to uh, back to all time highs that we haven't really seen since before the Great Financial Crisis. Um, and you can see we were on a long term downtrend for many many years. Uh, we slowly seemed to recover after the great financial crisis and it kind of held steady, but was starting to build up. And then really since 2020, that's just completely uh, fallen off here. So, 
Um, so these two dueling debt and deficits, when you have fiscal debt and you have trade deficits of this nature, typically is not good for the currency uh, in terms of the strength of the dollar. So that will that will have winners and losers, but I think it's safe to say between those two things we're in a new regime in terms of uh, in terms of the dollar. So um, well, it looked like we were going to see some dollar strength, but that certainly appears that it's rolled over now. And we've been seeing yeah. that weakness, which is interesting though. We're not seeing the small cap stocks who did really well when the dollar was going down last year. They don't appear to be doing as good. And uh, they've really been struggling the past week and a half. Well, actually, they've been for a good month and a half. They've been pretty much flat. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll have mm -hmm. to watch that and see how that correlation continues to play out. Yeah, and this so this is from Goldman Sachs. They they put out a financial conditions index, which basically just shows like, are we in a tight environment, a tight money environment? Is money hard to come by, or is it easy to come by? And you can see this chart only goes back to two thousand and twelve. Um, but wow, we're, we're very, very loose. According to this, um, it's the, it's the loosest liquidity environment on record. Which basically, let me interpret that. It means there's just a whole lot of cash out there to spend. You want to borrow, you're going to, there's cash out there. You want to build, there's cash out there. Uh, we're flooded with cash. Yep, exactly. And, and it's not just here in the U.S. Like you said, Darren, it's across the, the globe. So um, households, this is uh, from the Financial Times where it shows the excess savings as a percentage of GDP. So people couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything. They saved a lot of their money and, and the U.S. was the biggest beneficiary of that. Uh, but you can see globally, um, when you include everybody, there's, there's definitely a savings glut. And the next chart will show what that savings glut looks like compared to average. So the dark blue would be an average year um, from 2000 to 2019. So about a 20 year average there. Um, and then you see 2020, huge move up in terms of the percentage. And it's interesting to see these different countries and how they, they reacted in the different savings rates. Uh, but safe to say, everybody put a lot of money into savings. So where does that money go? We've talked a lot about this last year, Everything is about flows. Where where is all of this money flowing to? Where's the hot money flowing to? Um, and and which asset classes are are they going to go into eventually? Uh, so far, we've seen people adding it to savings, a, a decent amount going into stock mutual funds, right? Um, paying off debt. Um, and then you see the people at the bottom where they, <laughs> they've already spent it, right? We opened up a couple weeks ago and boom, it's gone. <laughs> well, it, you know, what's interesting about this on the saving side is it's probably the worst time in at least recent history to actually save your money in cash because of the devaluation of the dollar and because of inflation that the Fed's trying to push it. But yet that's where things are going or sitting in cash. I can't imagine what the markets would be doing if instead of all going into cash savings, this was actually going into the stock mutual funds, stock ETFs, individual stocks. Uh, yeah. Wow, would that be a bullish uh, move in the markets? And yeah. speaking of bullish. <laughs> yeah, we saw that. I mean, uh, we've been talking about on, on our On the Markets podcast about how much the S&P has moved up above its 50-day moving average. And we've got record levels of stocks above their 200-day their moving averages. Um, so a lot of that money is going into the markets and because people are, are confident, right? So we look at this survey every month to kind of see how people are feeling. We saw a little bit of a drop this last week, well, which is probably natural considering the markets have pulled back a bit, but still elevated on a, on a historical average. Cause as you see down there at the bottom, the historical average is about 38% bullish. Um, and so we're, we're near, we're near our highs, um, in terms of confidence. So um, we, we, these have not been matching up recently, which is is kind of surprising. But I guess when you look at the underlying of the of the CNN fear and greed index, I think Darren and you and I would both agree that we we disagree with a lot of their measurements and uh, and their interpretations of the measurements. Is that fair? I think that's more than fair. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, so this is pointing to a neutral. Um, however. 
uh, you know, I think if it was if it was lined up a little bit better, it would be closer to the to the greed side, uh, not extreme greed. Uh, you know, we're not we're not on the side of the spectrum where, you know, it's alarming or anything like that. But definitely, uh, definitely should be falling closer to the greed side rather than neutral. Um, one of the measurements they look at is the put call ratio, and so a put um, would be naturally a bearish. Uh, outlook you expect the market to go down uh, or you're hedging against the market going down a put is your ability to sell a security at a certain price and you can see back in uh, um, in March we saw some pretty high levels of puts uh, also uh, towards the end of um, 2018 in that sell-off in in December high levels of puts so on the top part would be would be higher put uh, you know, then then calls basically, and so you can see at the top of the great financial crisis, we had we had uh, very high put volume. Where are we now? Well, we're pretty low on that. Most most investors are not buying puts. If anything, they're buying calls. We've covered that a lot in terms of uh, you know the end of last year, going into the first part of this year, there were record high call volumes. We're still close to that. I think um, the only time that's been there's been more calls would be after the great financial crisis. So if, if counterintuitively, if you are if you are kind of trying to put in the bull versus bear argument here, you would say typically this ratio is really high um, when the market's at its worst and it's very low when things are starting to turn around. You know, if this is like 2009, which we talked a lot about, there's a lot of rhymes here. Um, you know, we may be coming out of that that downside and and entering a new a new bull market. According to that, quarter gold's had a rough go of it, but we did break above the fifty period moving average on gold today. Yeah, exactly. So one of the worst quarters on on record for gold after it had a great year last year, uh, really through the summer. Um, and so we it we saw it stall out. It's been really struggling this year so far. However, the last week or so, week and a half, maybe two weeks, we started to see some signs of life. And like you said, Darren, it, it did cross its 50-day moving average in a positive way. Uh, so that is, is a positive sign for gold. We'll see if it can recover uh, from that bad, bad quarter. Wells Fargo housing index uh, looks like it's pulled back, but still up with an upward trend. Yeah, still still elevated on a historical basis, but you're right. There was a bit of a pullback this most recent reporting, which was on the 15th of April, I believe. And so um, we've seen a lot of strength in the housing markets, which we're going to go through these slides here. And this would also be um, be a sign if you're if you're trying to decide whether uh, the economy is headed towards a recession or not. Um, you know, this this great chart from Bespoke shows that. Hard, there's never been a recession really on mar on record where uh, where housing starts were were increasing, you know, um, and here we are. So another one of the COVID first times ever, right? And so we had a recession, but housing starts uh, continued to to go up. We saw a little bit of a dip right before COVID, and maybe who knows if that was going to continue to to progress. But since then, um, it's really bounced back in a very strong way. Well, and this really is data that goes to my point earlier on, which is, you know, housing starts are looked at as typically a leading indicator, right? And this wouldn't have led you in the right direction that we were going to actually hit a recession last year. And that's part of the challenge with uh, trying to read the tea leaves from the fundamentals right now, because so many of them are just off compared to the, what they usually are. Right. You got it. So maybe one of the reasons why we've seen a bit of a pullback is we've seen a jump in uh, mortgage rates, which is not surprising. You know, we've been looking at this chart for several months now where we're comparing the 30 year mortgage rate to both the 10 year Treasury yield and the 30 year U.S. Treasury yield. And you can see that they tend to move together somewhat with the mortgage rate moving a lot more positively and negatively, but still kind of tracking along with these rates. And so we saw that pull up in, in rates and treasuries over the last couple of months. And the mortgage rate was really staying super low. And we just kept thinking like, when is it going to kind of start to track with it? Well, we've seen it jump a bit. So it, it's low as there close to two and a half percent on a 30 year, which is just insanely cheap money. Uh, and now we're up to three, uh, 
3.13. So. And so you've got the shoulder index, which tries to kind of smooth out the bumps uh, and their process uh, for the data points and certainly nothing but up here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, we're back on a long term trend of house housing prices increasing after we saw the big drop off after the great financial crisis. Um, a lot, you know, at least nothing that I'm seeing, I don't know about you, Darren, that would show a lot of the same speculation that was happening at that time where people were getting loans with no income. Uh, you know, your average person had five houses leveraged to the hilt. That's just not the case now. Um, this is more of an inventory driven uh, situation with, with the increase in prices at this point. We're at record low inventories of houses for sale. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, you're just not seeing the, the lending standards really not never got easier. Uh, after 2008 no. uh, it'll be interesting to see through this administration uh if there's a push to light make those lending standards decrease a little bit because there's a uh, a bigger push to create home ownership more broadly right right so this chart shows just a little bit more about you know back back during the housing crisis people were taking out equity to buy more houses uh boats all kinds of consumption, right? Everybody expected houses to just continue to increase in price and never go down. And, and that turned out to be wrong. Now we're at 48 billion in, in, in equity that's been cashed out, but something to keep in mind with this chart is, you know, you're comparing it to 2006 numbers, uh, which is, you know, 15 years ago, right? So 84 billion then is is a lot different than 84 billion now, right? So so in order for this to really line up, you would have to adjust this for the inflation and overall values in in housing prices. So I don't think, you know, based on these numbers, it looks like people are getting too crazy in terms of their borrowing at this point. We saw a little bit of a pullback in the two-year, 10-year treasury yield spread. Uh, we were up to about 153, I think, last week. A uh, little bit of a pullback to 145. There's going to be some noise in these numbers, of course. What we're looking for is a reverse in trend. Uh, if you saw that trend start to uh, head down towards zero, where that in, that yield curve starts to invert, longer, longer rates start to go down so that shorter rates are, are uh, getting close to the same amount or in some cases getting higher, that would be a sign of, of recession. And uh, so far, so good on that front. So it seems like consumers are starting to feel more confident, at least according to this article from the Financial Times. Um, huge V, uh, just like we saw at the great financial crisis. But you know, I, I don't know, Darren, I, I don't know how you kind of remember the great financial crisis, but I feel like at that time, people were pretty dejected, like their their finances were just a complete wreck uh, coming out of the financial crisis in terms of they lost all the value in their house. A lot of them have lost their jobs. Um, and although we've seen a lot of job losses in this recession, on the flip side of that, we saw people's incomes go up, their housing values go up, their asset prices definitely go up. Um, it just doesn't seem to feel as, uh, you know, economically dire as it did in 2008. I don't know what you think there. Yeah, I mean, the Fed stepped on the pedal so fast during this recession that there wasn't time for anyone really to even, I mean, you think about it to really experience any of uh, the recessionary, uh, typical recessionary pieces unless you were in like a uh, restaurant business or you were in uh, a business that didn't get benefits from PPP loans. There was just such a flood of money that came in. And certainly I don't mean to uh, minimize people who were injured through all of this and struggled through this and still continue to struggle this through this. But on the aggregate, uh, people were far actually better off after COVID than they were before COVID because of all the money printing happening. I heard just as a, a side note, not to bring it back to the Dogecoin or the Dogecoin, but <laughs> I, uh, on a side note, one of these trader groups I'm a part of, there was a guy in there who put a thousand dollars in Dogecoin, wait, you know, back when he got one of the stimulus, and it's worth like fifty thousand dollars now, 
And so you have a lot of those experiences and people who just completely gambled with money um, over this, uh, you know, recovery period. And, and that's played out really well for some accounts. Some accounts look incredible. Uh, and I think there's a preponderance of new investors out there that have done incredibly well and haven't had to live through a downturn. And there's a preponderance of overconfidence in the market as well. And, th and that would, I think, play out in the, the consumer confidence numbers, the feeling people have uh, when it comes to uh, the overall economy. Uh, like that old yeah. saying goes, you know, I think I've said this many times on this channel, but you know, you, when I'm at a party and someone finds out I'm in the stock business, they immediately start talking about their stocks and you can always find and figure out who are the individuals who are just new to the market because they really haven't blown up an account yet. They haven't really lost money. So <laughs> they don't really have that humility towards the market and what it can do to an account. And in fact, you can lose a lot of money. Um, I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of people who are going to lose a lot of money with this whole crypto run up because it is going to blow off at some point. I don't know when. Um, and I have some speculation about that, but I do believe it is going to blow off just like it did the last Bitcoin halving cycle. Uh, it's yeah. not going to be a forever thing. That's a great point. I mean, going going back to the previous chart for just a second and, and thinking about the amount of time it took to get back to the consumer confidence levels that we saw in 2007. If you look at that, you know, you're talking nine or 10 years to get back to where people felt, uh, you know, confident that, that before the crisis. In this, we're talking, you know, less than a year, which is really amazing. So that amount of time, uh, and, and just kind of destruction like you're talking about. Some of those lessons that you learn as an investor are best learned the hard way. Um, and, and you just wonder, were there any hard lessons? Uh, not that I'm wishing there were more, I'm not. But, uh, but when, when you look at all these speculative stocks and things that have just taken off, um, it, you know, there, is, there is a bit of a moral hazard that's been bit, built into the markets at this point. So, Absolutely. yeah, there's there's no doubt that moral ha hazard is rampant and alive. And uh, hopefully many of those investors don't ever have to um, be, hum you know, humiliated by the market. But the, the market giveth and it taketh. And we yeah. should always um, enter into it with great respect for how it can make you feel emotionally and what it can do to an account. Yeah. Huge numbers for motor vehicle sales uh, just released this month. And this is part of the overall retail spending. So it seems like a lot of that stimulus money might have gone straight into new cars. I don't know. Um, but, you know, when you look at it on a long term chart, it's really uh, it's really a blast off there for new vehicle sales. Which is one of the leading economic indicators, actually. So, uh, again, in the bullish, you know, bearish column, that would be that would definitely be bullish. Um, the the biggest controversy, right, is and the thing that people feel the most passionate about is inflation. And we just got the year over year numbers. We talked about those last week. Um, this this is a chart going way back to the twenties, which is really cool. Um, one of the things that struck me immediately, Darren, is how much volatility in these numbers there used to be, right? Yeah. And I guess if you look at markets from a standpoint of like, well, expected returns are lower now because prices are higher. But if you look at a lot of these numbers and you think about the fact that the Fed is going to step in and really squash any major, you know, disorderly selling, um, shouldn't, shouldn't investors expect lower returns if they're taking on lower risk? I mean, is that... Is that you know one plus one equals two type of equation? I don't know, but you can definitely say that there was a lot more volatility in these numbers. So I'm sure there would be a lot of conspiracy theorists out there saying, well, it's because they cook the books and they're keeping the numbers in a tight range, right? <laughs> I'm sure there's a few people that would mention that, but well, if you look but, at the dual mandate of the Fed, right, the the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve is to uh, not get maximum employment and to seek maximum employment and to create price stability. And based upon this chart, the Fed's actually getting better at their job, which would make sense, right? I mean, we've the, the whole reason going back to a few charts ago where we bounced so quickly out of this recession is because the Fed basically pulled out the playbook from 2008 and just put it back in gear uh, when we hit COVID. 
and they came into the market in a, in a very forceful and strong way. Uh, where it took months and months and months to do that in 2008, it took a matter of weeks in 2020. And, and that would tell you that they've developed tools over time. They've figured their job out a little bit better, which you know, to credit them, uh, because you certainly back the volatility in price that existed um, in the first part of the uh, century here, or I guess 19th century, uh, 20th century, I guess would be, um, then, you know, they've, they've done better at that. Or like you say, they're just cooking the books. Yeah. So oil, we had a huge glut in oil during the pandemic for obvious reasons, and that's starting to, to burn off. So the, the white line is the average um, uh, inventories in the OECD countries, and the blue line is where we've been uh, since 2021. And so you're starting to see those numbers come down, and, and we're, we're kind of burning through those inventories. Uh, hopefully get back to more of a normal market within the oil market, but uh, a lot of distortion going on there too, kind of throwing people off. You know, interesting here is we, we've we been talking a lot about, and we started doing this back in November. We say, hey, Biden wins. We think it's a uh, replay of the Obama administration. He's going to put a lot of the same people back in play. They'll constrain oil supply. Uh, they'll basically drive up the price of oil. This chart would certainly continue to um, confirm that thesis, right? Because we're running out of that glut of oil, which then will ultimately drive oil prices up higher. Um, given the gasoline prices are pretty high right now, I think Americans should expect that gas prices go up uh, over the next three years um, with, as we continue on through the Biden administration. Uh, interesting to watch, but this certainly plays into the, the XLE thesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of headlines starting to come out from these big companies that they're increasing their prices. So even though we're seeing no official inflation in the in the inflation data, uh, I think the proof's in the pudding for the companies that are increasing their prices based on their input costs going up so much, whether that's you know having to pay workers more to attract them because of the increased unemployment, uh, or if you're talking about the inputs in terms of the commodities, which we've been tracking that commodity prices are really off the charts right now. I mean, you look at lumber, it looks like your, your Dogecoin chart. <laughs> uh, so hey, hey, hold up. It's not my Dogecoin <laughs> chart. I, I don't own Dogecoin. I will never own Dogecoin. Uh, but yeah, I do like crypto. Consult an advisor. <laughs> it's not advice. Yeah. yeah. Consult an advisor, right? So, um, so some of these programs, to your to your point, uh, are starting to roll out in terms of, uh, you know, mortgage. You, you know, there's been a lot of, of uh, stimulus coming into the mortgage market. Uh, people being able to refinance to possibly into 40-year mortgages um, at little to no cost, which would be a huge boon because it would be increasing the amount of credit in the system, which credit is way more massive than the amount of money that's in the system. Uh, and this is another area where if we were to forgive up to $10,000 of student loans for uh, for folks, there's about 15 million people in the U.S. that that would affect, which is, uh, you know, a significant portion of the of the U.S. population overall, not, not to mention the adult population. And so, I've personally spoken to more than one person that says I'm not paying off my student loans purposely right now uh, to wait and see what happens uh, in case they forgive it. And uh, so this would be, you know, kind of a stealth stimulus or one of many stealth stimulus that could could come into the markets. Significant, right? I mean, this could be a really big backdoor stimulus plan. This was interesting seeing consumer bankruptcy filings um, going up. I wouldn't say astronomically up. I would say still within a down, long-term secular downtrend, uh, uh, perhaps a cyclical movement up, uh, but nothing I would say alarming given that you know everything we went through last year uh, and there was this kind of foreclosure glut coming through the system that at least currently the government's still holding off. We don't see that mm -hmm. happening, and this data continues to confirm that, although it tends looks like it's going up a little bit. Yeah, you would kind of expect to see a huge rush once a lot of these uh, moratoriums are are 
you know, reach the end of their programs towards the end of the year, you would you would expect to see more bankruptcy filings because you can see what what was kind of the trend line prior to uh, say January of 20, and it just dropped off during COVID, and now we're starting to see a slight uptick again. So it wouldn't be surprising at all to see a, a kind of a backlog come through the system uh, sometime next year. So central bank outlook, I think this is one of the big themes this week, Chris, and that is our in fact, the central bank is going to be able to keep rates as low as they are for as long as they say they're going to. You And that was the point with Dogecoin, right? It's it, If you've got this just glut of money out there and you've got this kind of speculative exuberance uh, manifesting through this uh, kind of hubris about trading and investing in the markets, you wonder if that's not at some point where the Fed goes, Time out. This isn't healthy. This is setting us up for a bigger correction down the road. Uh, we need to rein this thing back in. And, and this was kind of um, looking at what, how the central banks throughout the world are feeling. There's certainly more pe- more central banks starting to talk about hiking. Uh, there's still a bunch in no change. I'll bet you three months from now, quarter from now, this chart turns a lot more blue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this, this just made your heart. (laughs) Yeah, there's, there's a lot of surprising stats. I I thought on this, well, obvious one is that Coinbase has got a larger valuation than Goldman Sachs. I would not have guessed that in UPS and Barclays. Um, Also kind of surprising. So what is Coinbase for people who don't know? So, well, I I don't have an account there. I don't know uh, it it as well as maybe you do, but from what I understand, it's where you can trade uh, cryptocurrencies, right? Uh, Different types of cryptocurrencies. That's right. So it's basically one of the main hubs where most, and we talked about this on the markets or on the economy last week, I forget which one, where we talked about how much trading that actually happens um, on Coinbase and it's something like almost 40% of Bitcoin is transacted through Coinbase. And mm-hmm. then your Q1 earnings were about a billion dollars. Yeah. And the, and the market valuation is pretty huge on it. And so, um, a pretty big, strong showing. And I think, you know, like you're talking about all these places like bank of America now saying, well, we're going to recognize it as a legitimate asset class. I think Coinbase showing such a strong showing in their IPO, even though the price did drop after after they initially released uh, the direct listing, um, it it seems it seems like um, you know that legitimized it in the market's eyes. And and I will say this right because you and I have talked a lot about the government just flat out outlawing Bitcoin, right? And we've heard others like Mike Green um, talk about this and heard others debate him. I don't see how the government could just step in and say, we're going to flat out outlaw Coinbase, which transacts and is worth $149 billion without some very significant systemic breakages um, in the system. And I think the more and wider the adoption gets of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as a part of the overall um, global economic framework, the less likely that happens. And I do think countries like Turkey and I do think countries like India who have tried to push it out will do what China did last week and turn about face and say, oh, yeah, it's it's an asset class now. And I think that's the way it's going to get assumed into the, the global economic framework is it's not going to be looked at as like a currency is competing with the dollar, but it's going to be an asset class. And I think that's how the assimilation happens that makes it OK with these larger institutions like JP and Bank of America. Bank of America, uh, they can assimilate if it's an asset class because it's just something else that they're they they're adding to the pile, right? But if it's a it's, it's if it's attacking the dollar, if it's a currency of itself, and it's undermining the geopolitical stability of the United States, it's much more difficult to make an argument that oh, um, this is going to have a, a long term uh, lifespan uh, in the economic framework. So we had a big pullback over the weekend with, um, uh, well, I shouldn't even say big because it wasn't big. We had a pullback over the weekend with Bitcoin. And if you can see, these are the halving cycles. So we've talked a lot about this on this channel and other channels we've got. And uh, halving cycle is a period of time that Bitcoin follows. um, And it tends to move up and does a blow off top and then it sells off and then it works its way back up. Um, the closer it gets to the next halving cycle. And you can see this little green line right down here is where we're at. Um, 
in, on that halving cycle and you can see the pop, the, the pull down, what you'll notice is we're right on the precipice of what has happened in previous halving cycles, 350 days into the new halving to somewhere to, oh, let's call it um, 500 days into the halving cycle, we've seen a parabolic move, right? So you have this pullback over the weekend, but if Bitcoin continues to be Bitcoin, um, we're getting closer and closer to a moment when we maybe will see that continued play out in a halving cycle where you do have a parabolic move in Bitcoin that will make the move that it's had so far look rather um, minor in nature. So just something to keep in mind. I think it's important for people to keep in mind context um, when we have tough weekends. Goldman Sachs is now reporting Bitcoin as an in asset classes, as one of their asset classes. I think I saw this on uh, Zero Hedge and there was some joke about it. You know, every asset manager's um, worst nightmare is Bitcoin, right? Because when you look at how well Bitcoin's did, done compared to all these other asset classes, um, it's pretty um, stark and has made it very difficult for someone who trades bonds, for example, for a living. And that's all they do to um, demonstrate their relevance uh, to the returns <laughs> out there mm -hmm. right now. And, and so it's definitely appending a lot of the sacred and the, uh, the well-known channels of wealth and wealth management inside the, the financial system. And I think that's why it's uh, it's created a lot of opinions, right? And you tend to have people that really like it or really hate it, and very few people in the middle. And the people in the middle just kind of sit there and go, uh, "Okay, what do I what do I do with all this? I got these maximalists and these minimalists, these you know bond lovers who hate it, and then you've got these Bitcoin maximalists who are changing their eyes to glowing eyes on Twitter because that's the call and acts like a cult. So you have that kind of mix happening out there and uh, that, that's cr created a lot of um, questions in uh, the world of finance. Uh, so this uh, SPACs, um, Special um, uh, Purpose like, Acquisition purpose Companies. companies. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Remember when these were all the wit rage way back in like November, Darren? And it's yeah. so it's so uh, yesterday, right? And yeah, it's. Okay. It's good to revisit these, um, especially when the turnarounds happen as quickly as they have. But uh, a lot of times when investors see see the newest, latest, shiny object, it's good to take a step back and just realize that sometimes that hype can be can be not uh, the, the greatest thing for your wealth, right? And so uh, Chamath was was kind of the the leader of this SPAC group, right? And he, and this is the performance of the various SPACs that he's been in uh, in charge of. But to be fair to him, we've tracked, you know, the performance of a lot of this, the SPACs has not been great at all. And so, um, you know, buyer beware. Well, and I would say with SPACs or like anything, I think this first generation of them is going to be painful and there's going to be a lot of people that lose a lot of money because they're investing in them because of celebrities tied to them. But I do think that they're going to play a role uh, and a larger role, but I do suspect that this first round of them is going to be um, more or less a blowout experience for a lot of individuals, um, just like I believe Dogecoin will blow out a lot of wealth eventually um, after it takes some of it. Well, that's all we have tonight for On the Economy. Again, we appreciate you joining us. Please subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. You'll be notified when we go live. And um, as always, um, have a great evening and take care.